can as it can be. Today we're going to be talking about digital marketing and three good reasons to use it. Part of that is going to be breaking down sort of how it works and a proof of why conceptually it's a good thing for your business. And then one of the, and then uh, I'm going to end it by kind of talking about how we help customers uh, with their digital marketing efforts and where are good places to start. So if you're new to this show, first of all, welcome. Second of all, we are a full service growth marketing agency based in the uh, Minneapolis suburb of Champlin, Minnesota. We have a number of awards that we're proud of. We're Constant Contact certified. We are a HubSpot Gold certified partner. We're a Google partner. We're a Grow with Google high impact partner. And uh, we receive a lot of awards. So our main focus is on customer growth. What does that mean? Well, it means something different to everybody. So it generally means that we try and help you with new customer acquisition and retaining the customers that you already have through digital marketing, inbound marketing, and website design. One of the big things that I wanted to make sure that we covered today is this overall concept of why are we going to use digital marketing? What exactly is the point? How exactly is this going to help us? Well, if you're like a lot of people that I talk to on a regular basis, you have kind of grown up in a traditional marketing world. So you see a lot of advertisements, you see a lot of marketing, and you think, man, that's really expensive. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to do that. Or you're not really seeing the results of your marketing. You've done some things, it's been some help, it's not really gone anywhere, and you're thinking, I read all about this digital stuff, and maybe I really need to get into it. If you are part of a larger organization, you might have your sales team complaining, which is what we do in sales. I'm in sales and I complain all the time about the lack of good leads or leads in general. So they always want you to do better and put more effort into your marketing or did you try something digital and it just didn't work? Well, if any of these apply to you and you're trying to figure out if this is really an evaluative thing that you wanna do, this is, this is gonna be a good use of your time today. So <clears throat> ultimately the question that I'm gonna bring up over and over and over again is a marketing term called ROI. And what I always wanna tie everything that we're gonna be talking to today is how do you track ROI? How do you get it to a point where you can actually see, I did this, I got that result, and therefore I made money. So that's what we're gonna be focusing on here today. This is a, a great sort of uh, starting point of how we examine the digital marketing landscape and how we exactly we kind of look at it. There are four parts in your sales process and your marketing process. Your first is attract, then convert, then you're gonna close people, and then finally you're gonna delight people. This is sort of the life cycle of your customer. So through that, you can see you go from strangers to promoters and throughout that process there's a lot of different things that you can use a lot of different tools you can use and ultimately what the value uh, that direct marketing is going to i'm sorry digital marketing is going to bring to you is that you can reach them where they are which is online there's so much that is going into where your customers are and what they're interested in and what they're looking for in terms of solutions this is the place where they do it so the the third thing that we're gonna talk about today is how to customize an approach for your business that works at every stage of your buyer's journey. I see a lot of friendly faces on here today and a lot of people that I've talked to before and all of you have great examples of how your business is completely different than anybody else's. So for instance, uh, I have my friend Chris from Northern Minnesota who makes custom fishing rods. His business is 110% different than Bill Kincaid who sells uh, chromatic 3D materials that, to put in a 3D printer. So here's how I'm going to break this down for you today. I'm going to talk about this in four different parts and my three reasons to use digital marketing are kind of hidden within. Number one, talk about what exactly is the component of a digital marketing platform and how exactly it works for you. Second, I'm going to compare it to 
uh, digital to tra tra traditional marketing. Third, I'm going to give you uh, some metrics on how exactly this is going to be successful for you. And then last, we're going to talk about how to get started. So if I haven't, if what I've laid out here is different than what you were hoping for today, please feel free and add a comment in the, uh, the Zoom chat pane, and I'll be more than happy to try and cover it if I can, or at least answer a question for you today if you are uh, participating live. So let's get started. So this sounds really easy, right? You know, uh, you know, there's the internet, everybody use the internet, so therefore totally do it. It's kind of like poker though. I can tell you that three of a kind beats two pair and you can understand that, but ultimately what we really want to do is be able to make money at understanding that idea and knowing that idea. So it starts at the simple place of your website. That's where everything sort of revolves around and it's the spoke of your wheel. So I'm gonna break all this down, but the number one reason that we're gonna talk about today to use digital is that all of your activities, of which all these, are, all these six here are part of it, all of them build on each other to exponentially get better results. So one of the things that I see all the time in sales is, is, is people buy one thing from one company and they realize that if they try and Frankenstein something together, it doesn't ultimately work because they're got a lot of people who are doing one thing and they're not all building on each other. So you started, you built a business, congratulations. Welcome to the show. You made a website. You're really there. So what exactly does that buy you? Well, it buys you, number one, a little bit of validation. Yes, my company is real. Yes, it is a real thing. Yes, I have a product or service to sell. I've purchased a domain. I've gotten some hosting. I've paid a company to build a website. And tra-da, we're launched. And then what? What do I do then? Well. Then you got to, then you have to put something on it. You have to put a reason for people to reach there out and talk to you and that's content. So your website content helps people answer the question of why they should work with you and why, why they should start talking to you. So it answers questions, it solves their problems. It tells you, tells them who you are and it tells them why you are and it helps them show you, them why they need to pick you. So there's probably a more elegant way to have put that, but I don't like reading my own slides. So ultimately what the website is, is it's a proof of concept that somebody should raise their hand and either come to your business or they need to pick up the phone and call you so that they can have a conversation with you. It's the first step in the sales process. And it's important to realize that at this point, this potential customer hasn't talked to you at all but they already know you based on your website and your web content. Then we build out the SEO, which is a fancy marketing term that means search engine optimization, which really means how high do you show up when Google asks the question of people who do what you do. So you start to rank, uh, you primarily do that by having uh, a Google My Business page. So that starts with uh, having a map location, Put, that helps uh, tie in your site so your location can be found. And then Google starts looking at you and your content. And the goal there is you want your content to be shown you as a, as a subject matter expert to Google. So people start finding you in searches. And when they do that, then hopefully they'll start buying from you if your website was built correctly. But you're not near the top. And all these other people who aren't nearly as good as you are, are higher than you and it's frustrating you because all you really wanna do is be near the top. So what do you do and how do you accomplish that? You add more content. I know that seems weird, but it actually is how the game works. So did I skip? No, nope, I didn't. So we've already started by adding some content. Now we're gonna add more content. And the way you do that is by creating a blog. 
And a lot of times what I hear from people who are not experienced in digital marketing is, I don't know what to write. Nobody cares about what I had for breakfast this morning. That's okay. It's not, a blog is sort of a catch-all term. It's a digital marketing term for new content. So things like news, things like contests, uh, Chris from Lake Lady Rods, who's on the webinar today, uh, ran a contest this summer about uh, the biggest fish that was caught with a Lake Lady Rod. And he posted pictures of all of those people who caught fish with his big rods. Uh, and uh, he, he ended up telling a really good story that if you buy one of his rods, you ca catch really big fish. And every time he put out new content, it grew and grew and grew. So now look what happens our rankings go up because now we've got a much bigger playing field to deal with and our website has gotten a little bigger and it's gotten more things to be able to rank from uh, in, in Google's eyes. So we're being found more and more and more. So you are getting found, but boy, they're still not ranking as well as you'd like and there've gotta be more people out there. So how do I get at them? You do that through social media. Now there's a stigma associated with social media where people think, man, if I just open a Facebook page or if I hire somebody to do social media for me, then uh, I should be able to make a million dollars that should work. Or this gets back into the idea that I talked about originally of, well, I tried it for a month and I didn't get anything out of it, so I'm just gonna stop. Well, that's not really how it works. Really what social media is now is it's a content delivery system. So it's, depending on the social media channel you use, just about any of them boil down to content delivery based on the individual person's likes and dislikes. So when you create a social media platform for yourself, you push out your updated content onto those free channels and you encourage people to turn around and go back to your website. So you're able to extend your brand by having your logo, your colors shown so people know it's really you and you're able to reach more people. So now look what happens when you do that. Your, SE, your rankings go up again. So again, we're having more links back to our website. So more websites are out there trying to find us and more websites are trying to get to us. So. That's cool and everything, but I only have about 75 followers and it's just, uh, it's just not that much. So how do I get more and is more relevant? And shouldn't I be working with the people that I've already doing business with? Well, you can, and the easiest way to do that is email. So by adding your customers to an email list and starting to send them information about the things that are important to them, like, new specials or new news or a new hire or any sort of information that's relevant to them, you get to be able to push information out to them in on their mobile device or in their email box. So it's another spoke of the wheel that we're working on. It shows you more things about your business and it gives you another opportunity to put something that is your business related in their hands that they can have the opportunity to share with other people. So we do that, and then what happens after that? Well, more traffic to your site. Your rankings go up again. Cool, awesome, this is fun, but now I want to find the people who don't know me, and how do I find those people to get to work with me? Well, at that point, you advertise using something called pay-per-click. So what pay-per-click means is that anytime you see an advertisement online, if you click on it, the company that created the advertisement is paying a little bit of money for that click. So it could be anywhere from a couple of cents all the way up to the highest I've ever seen in my professional career was $65 just for that click. So, when you create a pay-per-click campaign, what you're really trying to do is micro-target those people who are truly the, the best fit customers for you. So you're doing things like creating keyword search terms for those things that those people are interested in. We're offering a, a higher level of solution to solve their problem. We're targeting them based on things like gender and location 
and interest. So when we do that, now look what now look what happens. Boom! Our site ranking goes up again, and now we're getting an even bigger opportunity to be found. So once we get really great high impact rankings, now all of a sudden people are clicking back to our site. It's people that we don't know, people that we do know, all of them are interacting with our website and our website is built to give those people a compelling reason to reach out and call them. So at this point in the process, you're gonna be asking yourself, well, I have all this traffic, but what do I do with them and I don't know who these people are. So then you offer them something special on your website. You offer them a download, something that it, it, we can do a give and a get for. So what a give and a get, it's kind of, another word for it is uh, gated content where we're saying, if you just give me your email address, I will give you this helpful chunk of things that are informational to help you in deciding what you wanna do and whether or not you wanna evaluate working with us even for, further. But when you do that, boom, now you've got an interested person because they've identified that they're interested because they've given you their email address and now you know who you, they are and you can do something with that. Isn't that great? It's a good thing according to Martha Stewart. So that's how traditional digital marketing works in terms of an overall concept of how, of how we, we spin the wheel. You can see that there's a lot of different spokes that go into this. And if you really wanna do this upright and do this well, they all spin together and they're all working together in order to grow your traffic and push people to your website to get people to raise their hand and say they're interested in working with you. So how does traditional digital marketing compare to traditional marketing? It's all about the targeting and it's all about having the right people at the right time see the right message. So that's our reason number two to use digital marketing. It's so much more targeted. So you get to, you get to, actually get to your customers, not just everybody, but your customers and the people who are like them. And then you could focus all of your efforts exclusively on them. So when you talk about traditional marketing, and that's kind of what I'm gonna spend another couple minutes on here is, what are some of the different things that you can do? Well, you can do billboards, you can do direct mail, you can sign up for a trade show, you can do sell sheets, you can do literature, you place advertising in uh, magazines, directory listings, uh, or a newspaper. I actually showed my five-year-old a newspaper the other day and he said, wow, neat, what is that? And he's five and he doesn't know what a newspaper is. And TV and radio ads. My son actually, uh, comes to our kitchen every morning and he asks uh, Google, the, our Google Home to tell him the news. He doesn't even read the newspaper. He just has it tell it to him. So uh, let's go through all of our list here and evaluate these as choices and evaluate whether or not you should do these, these things or not. So billboards and signage, pros and cons. Well, the pros, hundreds and thousands of people can see it, and hundreds and thousands of people see it on a daily basis. Number two, it's a huge space for your message. It's literally this big. Humor works great. It helps if you've got a local presence and it's a constant exposure to your brand. If you live here in the Twin Cities, which uh, a significant portion of you do. We are inundated with a guy named uh, Chris who's selling uh, real estate and he just has his hands up. And it's super weird. But tens of thousands of people have seen it and the problem is they charge tens of thousands of dollars for a billboard. Going rate right for a billboard for a month right now is about 15 grand in a month. The cons are as follows. For those of you who are at work today, question I have for you is you passed a billboard on your way to work today. Can you name it with any sort of definition? What did it say and what did it want you to do? 
usually when I give this presentation in person and I offer this presentation in person and I ask this question, I get crickets. People saying, uh, Chris Lindahl, well, it's a good guess, but it's not really the thing. So the next question is how many people actually saw it versus how many people called? Well, they can't really tell you how many people saw it. They can give you an estimation of how many people drove by it, but how many people actually picked up the phone and called? I don't know, which begs the question, how do you track that that lead came from the, the billboard? By and large, you can't. It's excruciatingly expensive and you have no real guarantee that your target market actually sees it. So the average ROI uh, return on investment on a billboard is less than 0.01%. It's very expensive and it doesn't relate into a, a great return on the investment. Okay, so maybe we do that, maybe we don't, but let's talk about direct mail. Okay, that's this is probably gonna work, right? Let's totally, th let's totally break this down. Well, we can get a more personalized message out to our people, so that's different. We can say as much as we want, we can put it in as, uh, as many pieces of paper in the envelope as we want, we can deliver great valuable information, we can target more effectively based on zip code, so anybody in a particular zip code, we can definitely give our, our message to them. Well, it's hard to track the lead origin because again, people don't necessarily read their junk mail. It's incredibly expensive because you've got to buy the list of everybody in that zip code. You've got to print everything. You've got to put postage on it. A pretty standard stamp right now, I think is 55 cents. So you should expect for any direct mail campaign to spend five to $10,000. And there's no guarantee that that list is reliable. People are moving in and out of neighborhoods all the time. I uh, have lived in my house for five years and I still get mail for the last guy who lived here five years later. From a con perspective, it's more effective if it's done more than once, which means that your money cost and your spend goes up exponentially, but there's no guarantee that that thing that you print and that gets sent to somebody's house and gets into that mailbox, there's no guarantee that it makes it from the mailbox into the kitchen table, especially if they pass the garbage on the way there because people throw it away. Average ROI in a direct mail campaign is between a half a percent and 2%. And again, cost of this is gonna be about, uh, about five to $10,000 per instance of doing this. Okay, so maybe we do that, maybe we don't, but let's let we'll trade shows. Trade shows, that's gotta, that's gotta work, right? That's totally gotta work because we can have a very targeted audience. We're gonna talk only to the people who are interested in our industry. We're gonna get up thousands of people right there. We can sell face to face. We can show our product or service. Uh, and it's, 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 it's gonna be super industry specific. Well, yeah, but, it's also incredibly expensive. The booth, the space, the travel, the, getting the shipping there. Uh, it's just, the, the, you've got to have people in your booth all day, every day. It's a lot of stuff to go into, let alone if you've got to travel, then you've got to uh, also uh, have uh, meals. You've got to have hotels. You're away from home and there's no guarantee that you're gonna sell anything. So the question then becomes, how many people at that show are really coming to see you? Or are they just sort of browsing? Now, I love trade shows because it's super fun and I'm kind of a carnival barker at heart. So I love to be really loud and really uh, get people to look at me and I do great at a trade show, but unless you have that really loud, really outlandish personality where you can get people to look at you all the time, Eh, and even that gets tiring for me, and I'm pretty good at that. And there are massive potential low turnouts. So any, within any trade show that you do, it's typically a three to four day thing, and at least two of those days are just dead. One of the more frustrating things if you work a trade show is about that second, if it's a four day trade show, it's usually Thursday to Sunday. And about Friday afternoon, you see all these salespeople just lined up 
with all their stuff they're ready to give away and they've just got this state of cat-like readiness. They're ready to jump on anybody who passes. And if you look at the people who are wandering around, they're usually, they've never been more interested in a ceiling in their life. They cannot stop looking at the amazing ceiling that they've got because they just don't want to be sold to at that point. So there's low turnouts and there's diminishing returns with the trade show. So, okay, oh, yeah, yeah. what if we just have a sales force and, and we build some sales sheets, we do one sheets, we, we lay out everything that we have and everything that we want to do and, and uh, push it out to our people. So a lot of these are a lot of good stuff here. You know, if we give them to our salespeople, we, we, we've got our branding on it, gives details about everything that we do. Uh, the researcher type persona in our target market, well, we know exactly who that person is and exactly how we're going to work with them and exactly uh, how to fulfill that need of, you know, reading about our product. And, you know, once our salespeople go through a meeting and, and then we, we, we give them the document at the end, then, then it's a leave behind. So when those people who are considering us, they want to have, have a point of reference while well, they've got that that piece of paper that we made uh, right there and it's called top of mind recall. It's a marketing term for fancy term for, for a leave behind. But again, we're talking, we're talking about printing at that point. So uh, everything that you do, uh, you got to print just by and large, I think uh, for busy web, we have, we have some sell sheets and we have some literature. I'm pretty sure we spend between a dollar and $2 per sell sheet because we've got nice, they're slick, they're on heavier paper, they're four color. You do have some limited space and you can't, it does get out of date relatively quickly, especially if you go through and uh, just clear cut your office and throw stuff away in mass, it never really gets to what you need to do, which is answering the question of how long does a prospect keep it and does it actually close a sale? So the average ROI for sell sheets and literature, again, you're looking at uh, a percentage point or lower. Okay, that's all fine and good, but I, I know what we're gonna do. We're gonna, we're gonna advertise in print. We're gonna find some industry specific uh, publications. We're gonna advertise there. So that's gonna be great. We're gonna have our branding on it. It's, it drives purchase intent because the people who are reading those, those publications are they're looking for new things, they're looking for sales. Uh, it's gonna get right to the decision maker. And then we can even track it with a custom URL or even a, a, a custom phone number that we put just in that specific ad advertisement. Yeah, but people tend to skim the publication we have no real control of where the ad placement is, or if we want to have a higher control of where the ad placement is, we have to spend a ridiculous amount of money to do that. So, you know, for instance, if you want to have the advertisement on the back of a magazine, that's usually three to four times as expensive as an advertisement in the middle of the magazine. People don't really read print anymore, or if they do, they're over a certain age. I know, um, I uh, like to think that I'm still young, but I'm really not. And uh, my favorite magazine, which is Sports Illustrated, just got bought last week and half the staff got fired within 24 hours. So it's not gonna be what it's, it used to be, which it used to be the, the, the gold standard in long form writing. It's just not there anymore. So average ROI on print advertising is usually about 0.09%. So still, running, uh, running uh, below 1% for value. But then we get to TV and radio advertising and that's a little bit better because mainly we have all these millions of people that are captive audiences. We get creative freedom, we can do cool, interesting things. It's 30 seconds of just, just people captivated and listening to you talking. You get your message repeated over and over and people remember them. Everybody loves a good, funny commercial. I, I, again, I have a five-year-old who demands that every time we watch a show, we watch every single one of the commercials so he can learn what's cool. The cons between that is that it's incredibly expensive, both in the placement and in the ad creation. We can't really tell where the return on investment is. If we are a B2B company, not going to get a whole lot from it, and it's not specifically targeted. I mean, you can target based on overall genre, but you're gonna be hitting everyone. 
let alone TiVo, where people are skipping through commercials. ROI for this, it's really untrackable. There's no real way to give a specific number that I was able to find. Okay, so here's the hard part, and here's the bad news, is that the way people have buy, buy have changed. What I have on screen right now is the traditional sales funnel, where within the first two categories, you can see prospects contact sales, and then in the second two, the salespeople actually guide them through. But now what we have is a journey that looks like this, which is all over the place. And if you follow those lines through and that choose your own adventure that I have on the right side of the page there, 80% of the buying process is done prior to anybody talking to you. So before anybody talks to a salesperson, they've already made up their mind and figured out what they're gonna do. They've done their research before they consider calling and they need multiple impressions and multiple validations that you're a good solver of their problem before they even pick up the phone. So it's important to take this under consideration because a traditional sales funnel is really dead and it's now all over the place. And I'm gonna show you varying examples of this, sale, this sales journey a little bit later. So pros and cons of digital, yeah, it is what it is, but every part of digital marketing can be tracked for success. And we can look at the metrics that actually matter and our return on investment is provable. Whether or not it's acceptable or not, well, that's a different story, but it's always provable and we can always, based on our tracking efforts, show that when we spent X amount of dollars, we got Y amount of dollars as a result of that. And that's reason number three to use digital marketing because everything is 100% trackable. Helps you gain insights, proves the ROI for your marketing spend, and it gets you an opportunity to grow and get better at the effort. So what I wanted to do now is spend a little time talking about what actually are the things that matter when you're talking about uh, uh, metrics and, and things to evaluate as to whether or not you're being successful. Because there's a lot of different numbers that are getting thrown out here. And the more creative marketing gets, the more it's data driven and everything has to tie into a numbers-based data-driven formula for success. So if we're talking about our website, we wanna talk about how much our traffic is, when does our bounce rate happen, which is when do people leave the website, how many pages per session do we get? Somebody looking at one or are they looking at four? How long are they staying on the website? Are they leaving within 30 seconds or are they staying for a couple of minutes? How many page views do we have, and then most importantly, how many new users do we have versus how many returning visitors do you have? Those are kind of what we look for at BusyWeb on what the, uh, when we're evaluating whether or not a website is being successful or not. With search engine optimization, uh, the two things that we look for are uh, in site health, which is, is the errors and warnings. And this gets kind of tricky because when you're talking about uh, ranking on Google, you have to keep in mind that Google changes its algorithm every two weeks. Rain or shine, it changes every two weeks. And so when that happens, the website that you've built has to be continually reevaluated to see is there something on your website that has to be changed or altered or tweaks in order to pick up wings wind speed you've got to always check your keyword rankings to see where you're ranking and within that keyword rankings here is the fun part is you absolutely need to check the traffic that you get from that this is one of the things that irritates me to no end and i've been doing this for 10 years is people think oh i gotta be number one on google i gotta be number one i gotta be number one i gotta be number one so once you're done with your webinar here with me today, if you Google purple monkey dinosaur, I'll say that again, purple monkey dinosaur, you will find busy web. We are the first thing that shows up. And I'll guarantee you, we get practically no traffic from it. And it hasn't made us a dime in the five years since we published that blog. So being number one isn't the most important thing. The most important thing is how much traffic you're getting and the value of that traffic because of that ranking. 
when you're looking at your content and your blog metrics, the most important thing from a macro level that I can tell you is, is the content on your website applicable and interesting to your audience, not to you, to your audience. So to that end, you wanna see how many views do we have? How many subscribers to the blog do we have? What's your bounce rate again? How long is the time on page? And you can see here is ours. This is actually ours for September. So we only had 981 people looking at our blog in, uh, in August. So that wasn't very successful at all. We had to make some changes to get better at that. But our subscribers did go up, so that's positive. Social media metrics, again, this has changed massively over the years. A couple of things that you really want to take a look at is your audience growth. Are you going up or down or sta standing pat? How many times have people interacted with you on social media? Those are called sessions. And then how many times has your content been shared? The trouble with social media that I really haven't put in this, but I did want to make mention of, is that you have to continually feed the beast. Depending on the channel that you're on, you do have to continually provide it with extra content all the time in order to get a result from it. Email, uh, there's a couple of things that you really want to focus on. Number one is your click rate. Uh, actually, I have that backwards. The, the right one is the open rate to start with. So how many people actually opened your email? And then uh, secondly is how many people clicked on something within the email. So if you think about it, uh, the open rate is how many people we put in the ballpark and the click rate is how many people identify themselves as wanting to buy a hot dog. We uh, also wanna look at have, has our audience grown or declined? What is our bounce rate, which is people who didn't get the email that we sent it to and how many people unsubscribed from our email. Hopefully the unsubscribes are pretty low. Pay-per-click, boy, this is really complicated, but I wanted to at least give you some broad metrics to look at and broad things to think about. Ultimately, again, what you wanna start with, and as you can see, this is one of our Google ads that we ran in August, that uh, we got 4,700 people to look at the ad. Isn't that great? Well, no, because we only got 188 clicks on that. So the, the click-through rate uh, is 3.96%. So that's a, uh, the clicks divided by impressions, that gives us a 3% conversion rate. And what we, that, what we spent on that was $1.62 per click. So that's how much money we actually met, had to spend in order to, on those clicks in order to get those people to go to our website. We did get two conversions, which is somebody who did something and filled out a form or raised a hand of some kind. So there is a value to be, to be put there. And finally, when you're talking about download metrics, uh, those are, again, those gifts, those things, those special things that you're offering people, if they just give you a little piece of something. Uh, the couple of things that you really wanna look at are submissions, uh, contacts, bounce rates, and then time on page. So ultimately, the, the goal there is you wanna give something that's valuable enough or somebody will give you a piece of information that then you can start tracking them and knowing about them and cultivating that relationship with them. Campaign metrics, uh, that's sort of an overall thing. Again, things like sessions, contacts, influence contacts, all goes into figuring out whether or not an overall campaign is, is uh, successful. So, wow, anybody want to take a break? Have I filled your brain up yet? Well, we're just getting started. Now we're gonna try and figure out how to get this started and how to do this well. This is a good point for me to stop and remind you that I am monitoring the chat pane. So if you have a question that you'd like to ask, please feel free and add it to the chat pane and I'll be more than happy to answer it. And that'll also give me an opportunity to take a drink. Cool. Awesome. Well, it doesn't look like we have any new questions, so that's fantastic. Let's keep plugging on. What I want to do now is talk about how if you, what kind of how we lay out our process at BusyWeb for how we really give somebody a, a great 
boost in digital marketing. And this is, these are things that we're certainly offering to you as an opportunity to copy and, 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 and follow because this is sort of a general theme, but to, to do the work involves uh, quite a bit of time. So how uh, the first question is, well, what can I get from it? And the, 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 the true answer is, I don't know. Each industry has different needs. Good things can come from marketing, but there's ideally there's a digital component to any campaign, but ultimately we need to figure out how much can we track and how much can we analyze. And we start by creating some SMART goals. And uh, what exactly is a SMART goal? Well, it's a specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, timely goal. So to give you an example, I would really like to triple my business by the end of the month. That's not really realistic because I have about 300 clients. If I had one client and I wanted to triple my business, well, that's arguably doable. But <clears throat> if I don't have one client and I have many, I wanna make sure that my goals are specific and achievable and they're realistic as well. So those are the five things that going into making a goal. And then the question becomes, how do you actually do that? Well, we've got a smart marketing goals template that I'll be willing to give you afterward if you're interested. But the question is that you wanna ask yourself, what is the goal that you wanna achieve? What are the needs of your marketing? And then put a number to that goal. Next, we wanna analyze your current situation, figure out what are you getting now and how can we improve upon that? Next, what's the time frame, and how much time do you have and what's your biggest challenge? These are all deep questions. These are hard questions and a lot of our clients we have to work with them to try and help them realize some of this information before we can even build out a digital marketing plan. Because ultimately what this breaks down to is what have you got that's working? Where do you need to be? And what's that gap? And how big is that gap? And what do we need to do to close that gap? What we start with is by writing a persona and a persona is a fictional representation of what your ideal client is. And here's some examples of the ones that we've done over the years for clients at BusyWeb. We actually write a full one sheet. We assign them a picture, we give them a name, and we even give them uh, things like uh, their socioeconomic status. We give them where are they located? Uh, what are they motivated by? What are their goals? What are their frustrations and what are their fears? Because if we really wanna understand what that person is, we really need to understand where they're coming from psychologically. And then we need to understand their journey. I told you I'd show you a different version of the customer journey. This is a good version of it right here. And you can see, again, it's all over the place. So the question that we have to ask ourselves as marketers is, what is the path to, that our persona takes when they're considering a purchase? Where do they start? Where do they end? What are the tools that will interest them? What are the tools that we really get to engage them? And then how does your marketing support each step in the process? You can see here that within this, really you're about two thirds of the way done before a salesperson even comes into the process. So again, what we're ultimately what we're having to do is, is take the sales efforts that we had in traditional sense 30 years ago and automate them and give those tools to our customers to be able to take the, to entice them to get them to do the thing that we want them to do. Should you do one over the other, digital versus traditional? No, I'm not gonna advocate for that, but there are options that you can do to uh, have them work together and in concert. So if you're doing billboards and signage, you wanna have similar ads, similar color schemes. You wanna offer a, a CTA to go to your website so you can actually track it. You wanna give them some gated content, again, and, gate, and capture that lead so you can do something with it, and then uh, nurture with an email drip campaign. With uh, direct mail, again, having a call to action, which is a CTA where you're asking somebody to do a specific thing, give them a reason to go to your website. Post those similar messages on social media. Uh, have something that you can download in order to uh, capture their information first. And even really what we like to do is for our customers that utilize traditional media is we even create a specific web page to go to. So that we're not just sending people to our website, we're sending them to a specific page that we can grow from. 
Traditional campaigns, wow, there's a, so much things that things you can do with uh, trade show campaigns. So what uh, we advocate is before the show, give your customers a reason to go to your booth, sneak peeks, something special. Uh, during the show, make sure you post a lot to your social media channels. After the show, use an automated drip campaign and downloads to follow up with all those leads that you got. But the key thing there is personalization. You wanna make sure that everybody feels like as they're dealing with you, they feel really good about it. And that's where things like inbound marketing comes into play is making people feel like they're already part of the family. And you can even blog about your experience at the show to tell it to try and increase visibility for the show next year because you're a thought leader, you're an expert. So the more you talk about where you are, the more those people who are following you are gonna be there too. If you do sell sheets, they are great for presentation folders and leave behinds. One of the things that I do is every time that I create a proposal for somebody that I hand it to them, I also include one of our sell sheets in there. And then, uh, but the information on the sell sheet is pretty much the same thing that you find on my website. So there is a CTA on all the sell sheets that we have that drives people to a specific web page that we can then figure out uh, what they're, if they've come from a sell sheet or not. With uh, traditional print advertising, again, similar things, similar branding, similar colors, similar photography, post those on social media as well. Run a similar pay-per-click campaign, uh, like the direct mail campaign, have a landing page that they can go to. And then with TV and radio, uh, again, a lot of the same similarities that we've talked to before, but drive them to a specific po per point so you can start evaluating the, the success of the overall campaign. Ultimately, what we're really trying to do is this isn't about how creative you can be or how clever you can be. It's really about how much we can turn this into a math problem. So to that end, we wanna measure as much as we can humanly poss possibly can. So we wanna figure out what are the metrics that are most important to us track them and track both the digital and traditional marketing to figure out what's the most bang for our buck and what's the thing that we need to spend not only our time, but our money on. And if you need to get granular, you can do that. If you really need to get into the nitty gritty and you even need some help, you can feel free and reach out to me after the fact. Relate those measurements back to your company goals. So make sure that your company goal is tied to a revenue number and the marketing is leading towards that, but don't get into analysis paralysis. That's uh, one of the things that Jen and, at BusyWeb loves to talk about. But ultimately what that is, is you, you're going down the rabbit hole of just getting paralyzed by all of the different numbers and figuring out what to do or even um, making one change and then looking at it and then being frustrated because the change didn't make that big of a difference. So I gave you three good reasons to, to, to use digital marketing. Primarily it's based on tracking and it's based on personalization and a tremendous amount of value. So hopefully you find, found that helpful. Uh, what I went through today, components of digital marketing, uh, traditional versus digital marketing, how to measure for success, and then finally, uh, what's a good plan for you to get started and how do you dovetail that in with everything that you uh, are already doing. So as I said, if you need more, one of the things that I'm gonna to offer to you as a, a thank you for participating today is our SMART Goals template. Uh, if you have emailed and registered for this, you will get an email follow-up in a couple of hours of, of uh, the SMART Goals template where you can go and download it. It'll help you summarize your marketing goals and help you set a de deadline for how to meet them. So that's my gift to you. Normally I. I wasn't really funny today. Sometimes, some days I'm not funny because I'm trying to be educational. Some days I'm not funny because I'm not funny. Today was more of an educational day. So normally this is my way of apologizing for bad jokes, but I didn't really have too many today. At least I hope not. This is a series that I do on a regular basis. Usually it's the first Wednesday of the month. Next month on Wednesday, November 6th, I'm gonna go into a deep dive on search engine optimization. So if you wanna get nerdy, we're getting nerdy. It's gonna be super fun. We're gonna dive into the things you need to know about SEO, and pay-per-click, how to create rankings, how to grow your rankings, and how to get people to your company's door fast. And the easiest way to do that is to go to busyweb.com 
slash events. Hope to see you there. And uh, <clears throat> if you are interested in uh, this deck, I'd be more than happy to give it to you. If you are interested in uh, getting a copy of my presentation because I was just that awesome, that's okay too. You can feel free and reach